Commander Replay, we try out this Patreon-submitted Feather Storm build. Is Feather going to be able to stick around for turn 19 of this game? Find out next on Commander Replay. Welcome back everyone, playing some Feather the Redeemed today, and today's deck list comes from a new Patreon supporter, Jared Zemlin. And so this is going to be a Feather Storm build, uh, and this is probably one of the last Feather builds that I have not checked out yet and have been meaning to do so. Uh, so I'm actually going to be running their deck list today and see what they've come up with and uh, see how that plays. I've taken a look at it, it looks pretty tight. Uh, they asked me what changes I thought I would made, and at first glance there weren't too many. Maybe other than this Ryle right here. Ryle is okay but I think you're really better off with one of the uh, instant speed uh, haste things like Crimson Wisps because you can draw way more cards because of the instant speed and I think that'll also matter a lot in terms of the damage output uh, once we get some of our storm pieces online. So uh, Ryle is okay, but I found it is really limiting due to the sorcery speed nature of it. And uh, I am joined by three Patreon supporters. We have Chaotix2075 piloting Grand Arbiter Augustine the Fourth. Ooh. Uh, this is not a fun commander to face. However, uh, we are going before them in the turn cycle, so that, that is good news. And then next up, we have Champion of Thune playing Ramos Dragon Engine. Uh, I can't remember what their Ramos build is. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've faced it before. I don't think it's Planeswalkers, but I can't quite remember either way. Uh, and then finally, we have Xenosai piloting Morophon the Boundless. Don't know what tribe they're on yet, but I'm sure we'll find out soon. And there's a Misfail Planes for turn one. We'll go ahead and play the Misfail Planes. And then uh, pass the turn like that. Uh, we did keep a hand that looks like this, by the way. Started with four lands and three spells. Not too bad. We have the uh, we have a card draw option right here, so we can get some extra cards going. That's pretty much always the key to any feather deck, is you really want to see one of these card draw spells in your opening hand. Uh, and then once you do that, all you got to do is get feather down, and you're pretty much off to the races after that. Uh, Primal Amulet should be interesting. It's one that I haven't messed around with too much in the feather builds, but I think it should fit really well into this deck. Chaotic said they don't know why this deck got selected, but they had meant to play something else for this video, but the uh, the new UI on Magic Online is a little bit weird sometimes. Uh, I've noticed some issues there as well, so has taken some getting used to. Uh, anyway, that'll bring it back to our turn. We draw an Elspeth Knight Errant. Should be pretty good. Uh, let's go ahead and play this Temple of Triumph right here. There's a Boros Charm on top. That's a pretty good one. I think we'll keep that one. And uh, we'll pass the turn like that. So it looks like turn three will probably just be blindly slam our commander. Hope that it doesn't get blown up by something. <laughs> Another opponent says, uh, Arbiter has some nice metagame against Feather. Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, for us, the key to the game will probably be keeping Grand Arbiter out of play. And so, with all the Feather builds that I've tried, and I've tried many at this point, I know there's a couple that I like more than I like others. I like the Good Stuff build quite a bit. I feel like I'm going to like this build as well. However, because I've been trying to play through all the different builds and still trying to cover other decks that have been released, I haven't had time to really try to master one particular build of Feather. So that's something that I still need to do and something that I'm trying to figure out, like which is the best build of Feather or at least, you know, which which is the best one for me. Because when you talk about having such a wide range of builds, the other thing too is just, you know, having the build that most suits your play style. I typically like to attack a lot, so, you know... The good stuff version is probably going to be a good idea for me, um, just because that's what I'm used to doing. Yep, there's the swords. So, swords onto feather, we gain a little bit of life, go back up to 41. Super annoying. Here comes a Mind Stone for the Ramos opponent. Uh, and yeah, so, and that's been one of the main issues that I've seen with Feather is that, you know, it was so hyped. It's so hyped and it's so good and it's so interesting that everyone just shoots it the second it comes into play, which is really frustrating. Uh, so I've been trying to, like, think about how to beat stuff like that. Obviously, including your protection spells, things like Adamant Will, some of the, some of the protection from color stuff is very good. But it does mean that, like... If you go turn three blindly like we just did right there, then you don't really have a lot of game against that stuff. You're just going to have to hope that nothing happens. So one thing I'm interested in trying out is seeing if, like, if you jam a bunch of really good early plays into the game. I'm thinking about something, like, really aggressive with a lot of low drops, uh, using that new... Using Ranger of Eos and the uh, new three mana Ranger of Eos to like get Sarah Ascendant down, uh, maybe some Giver of Ruins and things like that to kind of fill up those early turns. And then, you know, you go to Feather once you have maybe four, five, or six mana available and then start going about things like that. You know, in the situation we just saw right here, if Feather is the first thing that we do and is the first like reasonable threat on board, it's going to eat removal a lot of the time. So 
and that's been that's been a problem that I have seen repeatedly. So I think there's some merit to building the deck in a way that uh, you your early turns might be full of aggressive plays, and if you kind of run out of gas from there, then you go for feather and start getting down to the card draw and all the other stuff like that. But I don't know. I have to test that out. We'll see how that goes. Uh, anyway, uh, that does bring it back to our turn. We lay down the primal amulet, and we'll pass like that. There's a Kinjali Sunwing coming down for our opponent. Uh, flying creatures your opponent's control enter the battlefield tapped, so opponent getting all their stacks going. Cards like that are great against haste commanders, things like Aurelia, things like Godo, can cause some real problems for those decks. Here's a Jace the Mind Sculptor. Well, I think our Elspeth Knight Errant should be fairly reasonable against it, plus the Sunwing will probably attack in that way as well. Jace going with the Brainstorm mode. Yep, Brainstorm is a pretty good magic card from what I hear, so they'll stay at 3 loyalty. And the Morphon opponent does have an Awakening Zone and a From Beyond into play. Uh, interesting, creating all the Eldrazi spawn. I wonder if this is the Devoid Eldrazi deck? Uh, someone had asked me about that uh, when I did the other Eldrazi build with Morphon, trying to slam all the Devoid Eldrazi. I'm like, yeah, why not just go for the gold and slam the big legendary ones? Uh, it is cute to get the Jota or Fist of Suns combo and cast all your legendary Eldrazi for free. But uh, obviously the Devoid Eldrazi will be a bit more consistent since you're getting a little bit of help in the colored mana department and things like that. So that could be a cool build as well. Uh, but yeah, with uh, with Morphon, the sky is kind of the limit. But yeah, with Morphon, the sky is kind of the limit. All the uh, all the tribes you ever want. Opponent lays down a Herald Horn. We'll figure out what... Yep, there it is. The chosen type is Eldrazi. And there's a Rhystic Study. Yep, all this seems pretty good. There's a Firebrand Archer. That's a pretty good one. Um, right here, right here I'm thinking just Elspeth Knight Errant. So play a planes, play Elspeth. Uh, Rhystic Study will trigger. We don't really have anything going on, so we'll just pay for it. And we'll uh, we'll make a Soldier Token. Protect ourselves on the ground a little bit. Oh, never mind. It does come in tapped because of the uh, Kinjali Sunwing. And we'll pass like that. Here comes a Gisela the Broken Blade. Pretty sweet little card. Mini Baneslayer, basically. So Grand Arbiter seems to have some sort of uh, flying theme going on. Hopefully they attack the uh, Jace the Mind Sculptor. That would be nice of them. Going into our Elspeth, really? <sighs> sad face. Elspeth is good. It's not Jace the Mind Sculptor good. That makes me sad. So, so sad. Uh, opponent's going to use the plus two on Jace. A Fate Seal themselves with Jace. Didn't see where they put the card. So it looks like they're trying to draw their way into some action, and also probably try to keep Jace out of uh, out of range of the creatures on board. It's going to be a Chromatic Lantern, and Rhystic Study will trigger. Opponent pays for the Rhystic Study. Rhystic Study and Grand Arbiter Augustin are, like, pretty awful for what our deck wants to be doing. Tax effects. Bad times. Uh, so Morphon's turn, they're going to get a From Beyond, a Herald's Horn, and an Awakening Zone trigger. All seems pretty good. Opponent does not reveal an Eldrazi with the Herald's Horn. Opponent can attack our Elspeth. I don't know why everyone seems to think that Elspeth is somehow better than Jace the Mind Sculptor. That's deeply frustrating. So Elspeth down to two. Here comes a Sifter of Skulls. Whenever another non-token creature you control dies, create a 1-1 one, one colorless Eldrazi Scion. Yep. Opponent got all the Eldrazi Scions going. I wonder if it's like an Eldrazi Scion tribal deck. I wonder if that just kind of happens if you run all the Devoid Eldrazi. Eh, I'm interested. Opponent's got my attention. I'm interested. So bring it back to our turn. There's an there's an Johnny's presence. That's interesting. Um, so let's start by playing the land right here. Firebrand Archer is interesting. I wouldn't mind getting that into play. Uh, now that we have some protection for it, I would. That's something I would consider. Well, I guess we have this one too. Yeah, because we have some protection for the Firebrand Archer, I might get that into play. But that is a card that we definitely need to survive. We really don't want to lose that for any reason. So uh, you know, keeping that protected will be a pretty big deal. Uh, right here, we are going to give plus three to our soldier, and we'll swing into the Jace, put it at one. The question I have is, what is the likelihood of a board wipe coming down? Feather dying again would be a really big problem for us, um, but uh, we don't have any more land drops lined up, which is a little bit frustrating. Hmm. I'm going to take the risk right here and hope that Feather doesn't get blown up again. If it does, we're going to be in a world of hurt. Uh, but if it doesn't, then we'll be set up pretty well for next turn. Uh, Rhystic Study will trigger. Oh, eh. We're not going to pay for the Rhystic Study this time. We do have a Johnny's Presence. Feather, do uh, Feather does come in tapped. Probably could have tapped my lands better. Didn't really plan my turn out the best right there. For a little while, I was hot on casting the Firebrand Archer and then protecting it with the stuff. But since we do have enough to uh, protect Feather with uh, a Johnny's Presence, uh, I do like that play. 
So Sun Wing going into the Jace, and Gisela going into our Elspeth. Yeah, that's about what I expected to happen. No blocks from us. I do think the concept of Planeswalkers in this deck are very interesting. It does give us something to do in these kind of middle turns right here, where we don't really have the mana to go wild with Feather yet. And like I said, it always gets blown up when you cast it on turn three. So uh, the Planeswalkers do give you some potential options to do kind of in the early to sort of middle... Kind of like turns three through six, it gives you some stuff to mess around with. It does seem very interesting, so. Uh, because Feather does have a high likelihood of dying often, uh, it does make it not the most efficient blocker, since people just love to burn their swords in path on Feather. So that's a thing to think about. Something like uh, Aurelia Exemplar, which has like pretty similar stats. It costs one more. Uh, is a little bit easier on colors, but uh, also has Vigilance. That doesn't get shot nearly as much as Feather does. So, you know, I don't know. Interesting things right there. If you can keep Feather alive, it's a reasonable blocker for your Planeswalkers. But if not, then your Feather will probably get swords, then you won't have a blocker for your Planeswalkers. So that's kind of how that goes. We should probably auto these triggers, right? Uh, Ramos passes without doing anything. That smells like a Cyclonic Rift. We do not have protection against Rift. Uh, here comes Morophon. Yup. Ooh, opponent's gonna spell swindle the Morophon. Spicy. Uh, Rhystic Study does trigger. Opponent gets to draw a card. Ooh. Seven treasure tokens. That's a lot of mana. Probably gonna be seeing Grand Arbiter next turn. Opponent's got an influx of mana. It's not great. Opponent sending one Scion our way, one Scion at the Ramos, and four into the Grand Arbiter opponent. Sounds good. So opponent goes down to 40. I'm going to add Johnny's Presence on our Feather right here, just to uh, get a counter on Primal Amulet. We don't have anything else going on. Should be fine. We'll pay a life in the process, but seems worth it. We do get, I guess we do give up some information in that process. Opponents will know that we have uh, the Johnny's Presence now. But I guess if we're going to get Rifted next turn anyway, eh, none of this probably matters, if that is the case. Is this the Rift? Yep, here comes the Rift. Rhystic Study will trigger again. Opponent's going to be drawing a bunch. Ooh, opponent's going to have to discard a lot of stuff. Oh, that's savage. That is savage. Opponent's only got one open mana. Yeah. Ouch. We'll get rid of all those treasure tokens, though. That's good news. Opponent, ooh, opponent could have a counter. They're cracking a fetch right here. If they have one, they are definitely in a position where they would use it if they have it. Nope. They do not have it. They go up to 12 cards in hand. Rough. I'm glad that didn't happen during our turn. Uh, I usually get blown out terribly by mid-combat Cyclonic Rifts, so I'm glad that didn't happen to me. Being not as aggressive as I usually am is uh, a nice thing right there. Oh, do we lose our Ajani's presence because of that? Oh, does Feather have to stay in play? I thought it only... Had oh, right, it didn't resolve. Yep, the spell did not resolve. Okay, well, uh, fortunately we do have a backup on the indestructible effects. And in a way, I guess it's better. I mean, I'll gladly trade this Ajani's presence to... Uh, not get completely wrecked by a Cyclonic Rift, so I guess that works. Ooh, hey, there's an Eye of Ugin. Might be seeing some big Eldrazi soon. I'd actually like to see a land off the top right here. Really want to keep hitting those land drops. Uh, a Mana Crypt or a Soul Ring would be even better. Land, draw with Ryle, into Soul Ring would be pretty cool. That's going to bring it back to our turn. We draw Aetherflux Reservoir? Okay. Guess we play an Aetherflux Reservoir. Might as well get it down now while it can't be countered. We'll uh, put opponents to the test of seeing whether they have artifact removal. And we're at 41, so, you know, we're not too far away. Just need to cast a couple spells, and we'll be right in range. Opponent's going to crack a myriad landscape. Sure. Losing all those treasure tokens had to hurt quite a bit. I'm sure they had really big plans for their next turn. Kind of odd. They're almost taking, like, a turn off cracking this myriad landscape. But I guess if they need lands, they need lands. They're on... They run five lands, I guess. Turn seven. Yeah, that's not the best. That will catch them up a little bit, though, but they do need the game to go for a little while. Two five-color opponents. The question is whether they're running Crossing Grip or not. Uh, pretty much everything else we can respond to uh, with the Aetherflux Reservoir, assuming that we have 50 life. Here comes a Scry Temple for the Ramos. Here comes Ramos into play. Here comes that Rhystic Study back to play. Yeah, that's a Rhystic Study is really, really good after a Cyclonic Rift because everyone's trying to recast everything out of their hand. Ramos is going to crack a Mind Stone. They get hit by the City of Brass. There's a Toxic Deluge, X4. Eh, that's gonna hurt. Really wanted that Firebrand Archer. But I guess we're on the Aetherflux Reservoir plan. Opponents didn't blow it up that turn. It means that they probably don't have Artifact Removal. There's a Sentinel Tower. That one's cool. We didn't get a land, though, so I do want to try to get a land drop. Cast Feather. Uh, Rhystic Study will trigger. Opponents are just gonna have to let opponent draw. We need our mana. Uh, Disallow could be a problem this game. There's a lot of blue flying around. 
So let's target Feather with Ryle. And like I said, this is where you really want like uh, one of the red instant ones because we could just sit on that and draw two more cards over the next couple turns, over our opponent's turns right here, which we won't be able to do. But we will be able to leave up some of the uh, indestructible stuff. So we're up to 44, getting closer on that Aether Flux. Nope, opponent's going to Swords on our commander. We do not have protection from a color. So it appears that Feather will be dying once again. We have cast one spell this turn, two spells. The next spell we would cast would be the third spell that would gain us three life. That is not enough to Aetherflux Reservoir to stop all of that, so that'll be deeply frustrating. Uh, and we're going to lose our card draw. That that actually hurts a lot. So we have been swords twice in this game. Mm. <laughs> if we Boros Charm, we would have gained three life. That would have put us to exactly 50. Yeah, we can wait. And there's a Crush Contraband. Uh, all right, Aetherflux Reservoir down. Now we're running on fumes. Opponents keep getting all of our stuff. Yep, this is the feather problem. Though I suppose our opponents don't really have much going on either. Now it's just kind of, you know, who's going to make all their land drops. I was hoping to try and draw a land right there. Now we have to try to get feather back into play and try to draw more lands. Ugh. It's a lot of things that we need to go right. And here comes a Jace Architect of Thought. And that's got some card draw attached to it. That's a pretty good thing right now. Looking at Venser, Heroic Intervention, and Hedron Archive. That's Those are three pretty good cards. Uh, I think I agree with that pile from our opponent. Didn't see which one he grabbed. Went for the Hedron Archive and the Heroic Intervention. Will be much harder to destroy their stuff. Pretty good amount of removal flying around this game. Though when you see an Eye of Ugin, you don't want the game to slow down at all because Heldrazi are probably some of the best late game plays you can make. So yeah, if you know those are at the top end, then that is pretty scary. Here comes Morophon back to play. Yep. I think now's the time for our commander. Yeah. Just try our commander. Everyone appears to be tapped out, so no counter spells. Um, and yeah, we'll just pass. Hope it doesn't get blown up again. Hope we've gotten through all the exile. I can't decide between Sentinel Tower and Primal Amulet. Maybe Primal Amulet. Doubling up on the spells seems pretty cool, especially if we can find a card draw spell. Here comes that Grand Arbiter Augustine, so opponent's done a good job of holding that back until, uh... Till the removal is cleared, or at least I think the removal is cleared at this point. And Kinjali Sunwing coming back to play. Opponent's going to minus their Jace again. Going for some more card draw. Oh, there's a Bringer of the Blue Dawn. It's on us to arrange the piles. Strip Mine, Bringer of the Blue Dawn. Draws some extra cards and Austere Command. I would rather that they go for the Bringer of the Blue Dawn. It's a creature and it can be killed. Austere Command, on the other hand, is kind of a problem. Yep, there's the Austere Command. All the creatures getting blown up once again. Problem is we're not drawing cards or generating value. That is that is what's going to make us lose this game. I would even, I'd be so happy with something even like a, like a Land Tax, Gift of Estates, Tithe, any of those right now. Feather is a very mana-hungry deck, and we've been missing lands. We're too behind the turn cycle right now. All the removal. Ugh. At least Grand Arbiter is gone. There's a Bloom Tender. Yep. Uh, a Planeswalker off the top would not be the worst thing since there's just not a lot of creatures on board and they seem to be dying at a very high rate. From Beyond coming back to play for our opponent. Fathom Feeder coming in. Has Ingest. The Void, Death Touch, Ingest. Draw a card, each opponent exiles the top card of their library. Yep. There's the Planes. We're on 8 mana. Feather's on 9, I believe. Feather is on 9. So I guess we just slam down both of these towers. Hope for a land next turn. Or slam down the tower. Yeah, slam down the tower and then slam the primal amulet and hope to untap with anything. See if we can find a land next turn and maybe actually start thinking about doing something. <laughs> Here comes a God Pharaoh statue. This should make everything miserable. Should take the focus off of our artifacts, though. Next artifact removal spell will be flying that way. And each opponent's going to lose one life at the end step. Uh, God Pharaoh statue, also a really bad card for Feather. <laughs> Trying to cast multiple spells. So, uh, I've got a separate screen up. I'm going to check out the deck list, see what's going on here. Ooh, opponent's got a Sunbird's Invocation. Gross. Uh, so the deck's creator does have an Acroma's Vengeance in here. Could be very, very useful. Uh, Steel Shaper's Gift. Tragic Arrogance is okay. Not amazing for the current situation. There's an Oblation, which can get rid of one of these problem permanents. Uh, we're in trouble. So, there are about three ways to remove the Sunbird's Invocation, the God Pharaoh statue... Uh, yeah, that's not good. So the removal package is something that I would probably work on for this deck. Uh, well, there's an Ulamog. Let's see what Ulamog gets rid of. Sunbirds and God Pharaohs. All right. <laughs> Saved by an Ulamog? 
until it kills us a turn or two from now. Opponents got a response. Oh, they do have heroic intervention. Ugh, they can they can protect their sunbirds. Um, this should all be good because if opponents got the bloom tender, the sunbirds in play it means that Ulamog might attack them, and they can kind of battle it out. God Pharaohs is exiled, so that's good news for us. Yeah, opponents should have held on to those swords. I don't know if swords and feather every chance they got is the uh, the right call when Eldrazi are in the mix. Opponent gonna swing into the Ramos with the Fathom Feeder. Yep, I'm gonna get him for one. And a Will and Jest gets a Tarnished Citadel. I'm sure opponent wasn't really looking for a land right there, so probably just helped him out a bit. Uh, Dawn Charm. Prevent all combat damage will be dealt this turn. Regenerate target creature. Counter target spell that targets you. Uh, I don't believe we can do anything this turn. Nope. Pass like that. See who wants to deal with the Ulamog. Seal of the Guild Pack. Uh, makes spells cost less. There's a Diabolic Revelation for from the Ramos. X2. So, theoretically, that should get something that can deal with this Ulamog, because Ulamog's pretty good. Uh, that's going to trigger the Sunbird's Invocation for X... Uh, how much is that triggered for? It's triggered for 5, right? It's either 7 or 5. I can't remember how that works. <laughs> uh, they grab a Farseek. Okay, getting more ramp going. Finding ways to stay ahead mana production-wise. Diabolic Revelation is a sweet card, by the way. I try to run it in my mono black decks. It is a little bit clunky, but when you can tutor for like three, four, five cards, especially if you have like if you have two doublers in play, you can you can do some wild things. It's the uh, it's exactly the type of card you want in a game like this where everything's kind of stalled out and uh, you're probably going to have a lot of lands in play. And when you're looking for some gas in the late game, Toxic Deluge X10. Wow, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Opponent paying 10 life for that one. Uh, and they get a Vampiric Tutor off of the Sunbirds. Not too bad. That's also going to... They're going to lose two more life. So, opponent cashing in some life right there to not have to die to the Ulamog. Sounds good to me. Opponent said, use Evacuation, I dare you. <laughs> uh, they did get another Tutor, though, and that is kind of a problem. They're getting free stuff off the Sunbirds. Yeah, it's all it's all bad. It's all bad. That's a Perilous Fault. <laughs> this game should get even longer. Brings it back to our turn, we draw a planes. Uh, that makes us able to cast Feather, but I'm not going to bother doing so with a Perilous Vault on the board. Uh, so we will give away yet even more of our mana. Uh, we've had two of these late turns without doing anything, and that's a lot of mana production to just give up on, uh, which is not amazing, but, you know, with the board the way it is, don't know that there's really that much else that we can be doing. Here comes Thalia, opponent's brave, playing stuff into the Perilous Vault. Here comes As ooh, Azor the Lawbringer, you say. That shuts off all three cards in our hand. Doesn't stop him from activating the vault, though. Opponent's going to misfail planes the Swords of Plowshares back to the bottom of their library. Sure. Here comes a Steel Hellkite into the Sunbird's Invocation. Let's see what they grab. Going to get an Oath of Nyssa. Yep. Keep that card advantage coming. Opponent does not crack the Perilous Vault at the end step. It does make me sad. Hopefully with the Steel Hellkite, they'll force him into cracking it. We draw a gutter snipe. We're just gonna go ahead and hold on to that. Pass the turn. Three turns in a row. Haven't done much. Oh, Ketra's monument coming into play. Sure. Got some brave souls playing things into this perilous vault. Giselle the Broken Blade coming back to play. Oh, Ketra's monument will trigger. Opponent cracking a bunch of mana. Ooh, that's a Kozil extra turn. Opponent plays the Kozil extra turn, and uh, that gets rid of Thalia. As are the Lawbringer gonna swing into the Morophon opponent. Let's see if they crack the perilous vault right here. I would. Nope, they're just going to keep sitting on it. Not convinced that they'll be getting enough value out of it yet. Steel Hellkite going to swing into the Morophon, and now they're going to activate it. Part of me did consider just dumping all of our spells and trying to flip the Primal Wellspring, but uh, we're not going to be able to do that. Makes me sad. So, Perilous Vault can exile all non-land permanents. And opponent's going to crack the From Beyond, which I didn't even know was a thing that you could do. You can pay two... Uh, search your library for an Eldrazi card, reveal it, put it into your hand. That seems pretty good. Opponent's going to crack their Hedron Archive also. Oh, what nasty Eldrazi they going for? Eldrazi Displacer, huh? Oh, that's interesting. That could be a headache for us. That could be a really big headache for us. So, most of our artifacts getting exiled this game. There's a Tezzeret the Seeker, that's a good one. I'm going to search for an artifact X1. Probably a Mana Rock. It's a Soul Ring. Going to lay down a Felwar Stone. Opponent said this is feeling like a war of attrition. Yeah, no kidding. Turn 14. Uh, Ramos playing all the value cards, though. Still at four cards in hand. And they've been playing stuff pretty regularly, so 
that Jace refilled them quite a bit. Uh, opponent going to cast Morphon. Kozilek's return will uh, trigger. Uh, although, that's a May, so they'll probably just leave it right there. Oh, that's a Mana Drain on the on the Morophon. Going to be a lot of mana for the Ramos opponent. I would love a Mana Drain right now. So we're going back to our turn. Tragic Arrogance. I uh, don't think that's going to be doing much at this moment in time. So we will just play our Commander. And we'll pass like that. So Feather back into play. We're tapped out. A lot of things can go wrong here. That's a Bruna. Bruna, let's, what's Bruna getting? Uh, gonna get the Thalia back. What happened to the, oh, Gisela, Gisela got exiled, sad face. Thalia's still pretty cool, though, and will be a nuisance for us. Uh, over the next two turns or so, this Tragic Arrogance may gain value. I don't think this, this game doesn't look like it's about to end anytime soon, although uh, Ramos about to get a lot of mana, which might be an issue. Seven colorless mana. I'm generating loads and loads of mana. It's a Contagion Engine. This seems bad. We'll kill the Thalia. Thalia down. Bruna just a teeny bit smaller. Sphere of safety, no. Uh, one enchantment currently. Bringer of the Black Dawn, that needs to die. That vampiric tutors every turn. That is very bad. And opponent's gonna prol proliferate, then proliferate again with the Contagion Engine. So Bruna gonna be getting much, much smaller. Opponent sadly leaving two mana open. They have one card in hand. Hmm. We're probably still gonna, just going to have to go for it and try to, like, blast them with Feather and then hope that, like, Bruna can finish it up. I guess if we I guess we only need to get him to 18 <laughs> uh, because of the Bringer of the Black Dawn. We might be able to do that. Opponent said he punted with the Diabolic Revelation by not getting Strip Mine. Yeah, that is probably true. Probably true. Also, getting into the point in the game where this Eye of Ugin might, uh, might make itself useful for our opponent and actively bad for us. There's a Conduit of Ruin. That one's also bad. Opponent is down to 13, though. If we get Gutter Snipe down and just start casting a flurry of spells, uh, they might die. I would love to see Protection from a Color uh, as the next card we draw. That would be super, super helpful. Here comes an Eldrazi Displacer. That can be super annoying. Opponent doesn't have any Colorless currently. Brood Monitor. Now that's part of an infinite combo. I don't remember what the combo is, but... I know that it's part of one. Uh, probably with the Displacer, right? Yeah, that seems bad. So opponent pays three to blink the Brood Monitor. Brood Monitor comes back in. Uh, so he has infinite activations. That all seems bad. Do we have to Tragic Arrogance? Play the land. Tragic Arrogance does not help the Bringer of the Black Dawn problem, though. Guess that means we just try to get down the Gutter Snipe. Let's play Gutter Snipe. Uh, we might have to wait until opponent, like, uses all their mana on the Displacer, which is unfortunate. Uh, swing into the face of the... You know what? Is it even worth it? I don't know. For one? Yeah, I think it's worth the one. So attack opponent's face for one. Champion said he's 100% removing Displacer on his turn. Cool. Cool. Uh, so we'll probably wait for that before we start doing anything. Uh, Tesseret is in ultimate range. That's a thing to watch out for. Uh, I guess we have a Dawn Charm to protect ourselves. When it goes down to 17, 3 Commander. Here comes a Nar Narset Transcendent Master. Oh boy. Opponent's going to plus 1. Reveals a Signet. Plays an Ethereum Sculptor. Interesting. And then going to play the Signet. And a Soul Ring. Empties out their hand. Bruna going to swing into the Tesseret. That'll keep it off ultimate. Bringer of the Black Dawn's going to trigger. Yep. Opponent goes down to 15. We're getting close. Don't know what they tutored for. Going to untap two artifacts. Opponent going to proliferate the Contagion Engine. Sure. Proliferates the Tesseret. It's back up to 7. Bruna's down to an 0-2. Uh, there's a Nexus of Fate. Mm, okay. It all seems bad. Uh, they can take infinite turns. Hmm. Uh, they can't go infinite. They do not have enough life. So, Bringer of the Black Dawn will trigger once again. Opponent's going to cast Ramos. Sure. Opponent gets to untap two artifacts. Opponent's going to use the City of Brass. Get that life total lower. Number of spells we need to kill them is decreasing by the minute. Here comes another Nexus of Fate. Okay. Ramos will, Ramos will get a counter on it. We need to cast six spells. Right now we could cast three. Bringer of the Black Dawn will trigger once again. Five spells. Opponent can untap some artifacts. Here comes a Chandra Flame Caller. Ooh, this could be interesting. Uh, because it can blow up the Eldrazi Displacer, which is kind of a thorn on our side right now. It's going to go X3 on the Flame Caller. Let's see if Xeno responds at all. It's going to exile the Ramos. Okay. Uh, they no longer have the ability to activate Eldrazi Displacer. That's good news. 
So we're going to Boros Charm and give our stuff indestructible. Gutter Snipe will trigger for two. Uh, we should have used Adamant's Will, honestly. Because Feather would have survived and we could have just gotten it back. We only needed to protect the Gutter Snipe, so that was a misplay on my part. Opponent's going to proliferate with the Contagion Engine, sure. Opponent can attack into the Narset, sure, I'm okay with that. Narset, bring Narset down a bit. Ooh, that's a Supreme Verdict. Uh, our stuff is still indestructible. That will get ooh, that gets rid of opponent's bringer of the Black Dawn. Okay. Yeah, that all seems fine. That all seems fine. Opponent's down to zero cards in hand. That's good news. <laughs> opponent says you fool. Uh yep, I'm still indestructible. So that Boral Charm does pay off. <laughs> it says now you've doomed us all. Oh, hey, that's an Arta that's an artisan of Kozilek. That would be five damage to each creature, and that would be not amazing. Um, I think Gutter Snipe is the one that we're going to want to protect. Oh, we can actually protect both. We can regenerate. I don't know if we have time to respond to Kozilek's return, so I'm just going to do it all now. I put play Adamant's Will on the Gutter Snipe and play Dawn Charm, regenerate Feather. So our stuff is protected from the Kozilek's return. Uh, opponent's going to get back an Ulamog, which is pretty nasty. Pretty, pretty nasty. But all we need to do is untap. We should be able to blast them and then just cast more spells. Yeah, opponent says uh, opponent was going to try to go for Chain Veil. But that's going to go to the end step. Opponent's got an Ulamog and an Artisan of Kozilek, but I think we're okay. They have only colorless mana. It's going to bring it back to our turn. Ephemeral Shield. Target creature gains indestructible until end of turn. Sweet. More indestructible. Play Adamant's Will on Feather. Gutter Snipe will trigger. Feather will trigger. Let's get down to the attacks. Send Gutter Snipe into the Narset. That should kill it. And send Feather into the Morophon. So Morophon finally down. Narset goes down. We'll play Ephemeral Shield on our Gutter Snipe. That'll trigger the Gutter Snipe one more time. Trigger the Feather one more time. This should take care of the Ramos opponent. And they go down. So now we just have to deal with the Grand Arbiter Augustine. Um, they have zero cards. But even just casting Grand Arbiter is like not amazing for us. Uh, I'm also going to cast the Dawn Charm right here, just because they're tapped out. See if we can get that little bit of extra damage in uh, before Grand Arbiter likely comes back to play. So then we go to the end step. We get three Feather Triggers, bringing back all our spells. Opponent gets a chance to untap. Yep, here comes the Grand Arbiter. Opponent's got one card in hand. Hopefully it's not removal or counters. Uh, we will cast some spells before Grand Arbiter comes in. Gutter Snipe will trigger. Feather will trigger. Uh, we'll put the Ephemeral Shield on the Gutter Snipe. Keep getting those damage triggers. Grand Arbiter into play. Opponent's got some mana floating. Plays a land. Uh, okay, opponent opponent drew a land per turn. That's good news for us. We might be able to do this. We just, uh, I don't think... Ooh, that's a Chandra Torch of Defiance, huh? Yeah, Chandra makes me feel really good about things. It does cost five. Play Chandra. Let's use the Exile ability. It's a land. Opponent's down to 22. Do some attacking. Could have also shot Grand Arbiter right there, but seems okay at the moment. feel like getting additional cards. Plus, we still got some damage in anyway, so that's cool too. Although, ooh, yeah, Grand, Grand Arbiter's ability making things a little nasty for us. Uh, potentially worth shooting. We won't be able to cast another spell, actually. Opponent goes down to 15. Five commander damage. Gotta stay out of the big top deck. That's all we gotta do. Sphinx's revelation would be terrible. It's an approach to the second sun. That one's also pretty good from what I hear. Uh, goes what? Seventh from the top. Opponent's back up to 22. Brings it back to our turn. We draw a talisman. Let's, uh, yeah, it's definitely time to shoot the Grand Arbiter. Grand Arbiter down. Uh, full speed ahead with our creatures. Play the Adamant Will. Get the two extra damage. Got our Snipe will trigger. I think we're in pretty good shape now. Opponent's down to 13. Should be able to take care of this next turn. Play the Talisman. Pass like that. Opponent catches a land. Think we're in the clear. Recasting Grand Arbiter. Let's uh, play everything in response. So cast all our stuff. Put a bunch of spells on the stack. Let Gutter Snipe do its magic. Opponent's down to seven. Our spells come back at the end step. Brings it back to our turn. We draw a Signet plus the Chandra. It's an electrostatic field. Why not cast it? Uh, play the Adamant Will on the Feather, and this should do it. Oh, yep, right, it costs one more. Electrostatic deals one damage to an opponent. Gutter Snipe will deal some damage to an opponent. Feather's ability triggers. Opponent's at four. Go to combat. And finish it off. Send it in for five. <laughs> 
opponents having some discussion. And down they go. We have anything good coming? Ah, ablation. That was a long game. That was 19 turns. We took three turns off while there was a Perilous Vault in play. That was a thing that happened. Lots of removal in this game. So, so much removal. So before we get into the recap of this game, there is going to be a second part to this video where I'm going to go through Jared's deck list and make some changes that I think will help the deck out quite a bit. I did notice a few shortcomings in the deck as I was playing through, and that's uh, that's definitely going to be a lack of artifact and enchantment removal. So that's the thing that we're going to want to clean up. I think there's also a couple spell choices that we can uh, improve upon, as well as some things that generate value better when Feather is not in place. So be sure to check out that video, and that'll be posted directly after this video. Anyway, in terms of recapping this game... Interesting game. It was a very long game, uh, finishing up on turn 19, and I think some of the big stuff really happened around turn 15. Just tons and tons of removal through the early parts of the game, and even when we thought the removal was gone, more removal showed up. Blew up Feather at least, what, three, four times? Basically, no one really had anything in play on like turn 10 or 11, so just a really, really slow moving game. Where we started to get ahead was when our opponents started playing a bunch of stuff into the Perilous Vault on board. Uh, that's a really scary proposition. So, so generally, you don't want to be playing your stuff into a Perilous Vault or into a Nevenrolls Disc. Nevenrolls Disc is a little bit easier to protect yourself from since it's much easier to get indestructible than it is to protect yourself against Exile. Teferi's Protection and Disallow are the only two things that are really coming to mind for me. But yeah, we were able to climb back in the game when we just took a bunch of turns off and let opponents cast a bunch of stuff into that Perilous Vault. And then once they blew the vault, we still had a reasonable amount of things left, and I think opponents were kind of on fumes at that point. That was sort of the big play in the game right there, just letting our opponents have all their stuff get exiled. And that was what really gave us the chance to get back in it. Overall, I do like the way this deck is built, even though there's some changes that I'm going to make in the next video. Uh, I think the core concept is pretty solid, and is pretty similar to the Storm build that I'm going to try myself. So I do think that this deck is in pretty good shape, but I still think there's some room to make it better. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this video. As always, feel free to comment, like, or subscribe. Thank you for watching. I want to thank my awesome Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome. If you want to help support the channel and vote on which decks I play next, or if you're just looking to get some high-quality games of MTGO, feel free to check out my Patreon at the link below.